In this video, we'll talk about hydrocephalus. Hydrocephalus is a disease where excess of cerebrospinal fluid accumulates in the brain ventricles. Too much of cerebrospinal fluid exerts associated pressure and that can damage the brain and the brain function could be altered. So let's talk about the common signs of hydrocephalus. Common signs involve an unusually large head, rapid increase of head size, then bulging of a tense soft tissue known as fontanelle which is present on the top of the head. These are some common signs. Now hydrocephalus can be caused due to two reasons. First, faulty reabsorption of the CSF and secondly, overproduction of the CSF. Now these are the brain ventricles and choroid plexus. So there are lateral ventricles, third ventricle and fourth ventricle. Lining all of these ventricles, we have a tissue known as choroid plexus, which has epithelial cells and this tissue is responsible for the secretion of cerebrospinal fluid. This tissue secretes the cerebrospinal fluid into the ventricles. Now in hydrocephalus, the balance between the cerebrospinal fluid production and reabsorption is altered. So cerebrospinal fluid is generated by the choroid plexus as seen by this arrow. Then it passes through the ventricles and moves out of the ventricle via cisterna magna and then it circulates all around the brain and ultimately get reabsorbed by arachnoid granulation. Now CSF reabsorption is really important. If this process is hampered, then excess CSF is accumulated. So overall, this is a drainage problem. Now this balance is disrupted in hydrocephalus. So either there is an enhanced CSF production or there is a less reabsorption of the CSF. All of these can lead to accumulation of CSF in the ventricle and that builds up to massive pressure which is actually damaging to the brain. Now hydrocephalus can be classified into two forms. One is communicating hydrocephalus, another is non-communicating. In communicating hydrocephalus, CSF is blocked after it is exiting the ventricle. Most of the cases, it's a reabsorption defect. Now, this is called communicating because the CSF can still flow between the ventricles. And of most of the cases, the reabsorption via arachnoid villi is faulty. In case of non-communicating hydrocephalus, the CSF is blocked along the, along the path of the ventricles. So, the CSF cannot move from one particular ventricle to another particular ventricle, so one ventricle gets bigger and this leads to an obstructive form of hydrocephalus. Now let us look at these things in a bit more details. So here is communicating hydrocephalus. That means there is a reabsorption defect. Generally the uh, overall CSF is reabsorbed via the arachnoid villi or arachnoid granulation but in this case the reabsorption is faulty which leads to an accumulation. Now, inflammation of the arachnoid granulation is the key cause of this kind of communicating hydrocephalus. And inflammation might be due to meningitis, like a bacterial infection, or there could be hemorrhage in the subarachnoid space. All these things lead to faulty reabsorption of the CSF that leads to overall increase in the pressure in the ventricles. Also, there could be problems like choroid plexus tumors that leads to overproduction of the CSF or overproduction of one component of the CSF. All these things lead to communicating format of hydrocephalus. Now there is non-communicating form of hydrocephalus where there could be birth defect due to which the, the, uh, the passage way from one ventricle to another ventricle is blocked. One such scenario is aqueductal stenosis and this is very common in many individuals and it's generally congenital and it's one form of obstructive hydrocephalus. Now this leads to a accumulation of CSF 
in the lateral ventricles which build up massive pressure. Now there are different molecular mechanisms which can explain hydrocephalus or overproduction of the CSF. Now several infections such, such as a bacterial infection that, that we see in the meningitis, that bacterial infection or let's say hemorrhage can lead to activation of specific signaling pathway. So lipopolysaccharides present in bacteria or let's say the methyl hemoglobin present in the uh, hemorrhagic uh, uh, debris, all of that can activate specific toll-like receptor. One toll-like receptor is TLR4. TLR4 activation leads to NF-kappa beta activation which ultimately via TNF, TNF alpha and via specific other kinases such as PAC kinases can actually activate channels that secretes huge amount of water in the ventricle. So overproduction of CSF occurs. So this is one of the molecular mechanisms out of many that are described right now. These latest research information are provided in the description box. You can check it out anytime. Now let's talk about the diagnosis of the hydrocephalus. Hydrocephalus can be diagnosed using MRI or CT scan. Obviously, after birth, looking at the overall head size give us some idea about it, but confirming that and trying to understand whether the how is how the ventricular volume has changed or whether there is any problem in the choroid plexus, in order to understand those things, MRI or a CT scan is really important. So this is how the normal um, brain look like, and this is how a hydrocephalus brain under MRI look like. This image is taken from Mayfield Clinic. Definitely check out their website link is provided in the description box. Now the most common treatment for hydrocephalus is surgical insertion of a drainage system. So overall as I mentioned this is a drainage problem. So one can solve this problem by creating a side passage and that is known as a shunt. Here one kind of insertion is taken into the ventricle and that drains into the abdominal cavity. So and from where it can be reabsorbed. Now people who have hydrocephalus usually need a shunt system for rest of their lives and this shunt system has to be monitored periodically. Now there are other measures such as endoscopic third ventri ventriculotomy and this is basically one kind of invasive measure. Surgeons make a hole in the uh, skull and pass an endoscope through the brain which reaches the ventricle from where it can scoop out a little bit portion of the third ventricle and ultimately connecting all the ventricle making a way for the drainage system. Now in summary we have learned there are two major type of hydrocephalus communicating non and non-communicating. Now there are communicating hydrocephalus which can be caused due to congenital problems, developmental and genetic factors. Now non-communicating hydrocephalus can be occurring due to hemorrhage, infection, neoplasm, etc. Now there could be uh, other treatment options in case of uh, communicating hydrocephalus. Generally using a shunt is good enough. But in case of non-communicating uh, hydrocephalus, there could be other particular uh, treatment options like EVCs and burning out the choroid plexus to reduce the CSF production, etc. Many more notes regarding these topics can be obtained from my Facebook page or my Instagram page. Don't forget to follow that. You can find a lot of dynamic flashcards which would help your revision. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe. My course is present in Unacademy which is India's biggest online learning platform. Using a code AP10, can, you can get 10% discount. See you in next video.